Welcome everyone to the ORLA podcast. This is the first episode of we are going to be doing a roughly chapter by chapter discussion of this book, Rock and Sand, an Orthodox Appraisal of the Protestant Reformers and Their Teachings by Archpriest Josiah Trenum. And I'm going to be, I'm here with my friend Elisha. We're going to be, we're reading through it together and we're going to be discussing it. And we're going to be working our way through the whole book. So I'll just hand it off to Elisha if he wants to say anything before we get started. Yo yeah, guys, well I'm Elisha and I'm a friend of my, my buddy David. We really like talking about theology from time to time. And this book came up from a kind of a referral from my buddy David's um, friends and, and network. And, I, you know, just piquing our curiosity, we thought we might dive into this book. Talk, talk a little bit about history, what's going on um, with the, the church and key figures and a little bit about the Reformation. You know, I think that's always a fact of curiosity for me when it comes to, you know, how did people in history, in a way, stand up for what they believe in, you know, or really be authentic in that measure. So hopefully, you know, in the upcoming weeks we can really enjoy this, um, this process of doing like a little book study and, and walking through these pages. So when talking about this book, one of the first things that came to mind was this author, Josiah Trenum. He seems like a really cool guy. Did you know anything about him? Yeah, so um, I'm going to just read a little bit of his bio here. Um, he's one of the guys getting into orthodoxy I've, you know, had a positive view of. And he's got his own organization called Patristic Nectar. Um, you can find more at Patristic Nectar publications. I think there might be some other things, but I'm going to read a little bit of his bio here. Father Josiah Trenum is a native Southern Californian. He was ordained to the Holy Priesthood in 1993 and was awarded the PhD in theology from the University of Durham, England in 2004. He has served as pastor of St. Andrew Orthodox Church in Riverside, California since 1998. Father Josiah was married in 1988 and has 10 children. Father Josiah has been interviewed by Fox News, Voice of Russia, Russian Television, Ancient Faith Radio, Culture Shocks, the radio show of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, and, new, and numerous local news outlets, ABC, NBC, KTLA, 590 AM Talk Radio, and more. And let's see. Father has served as an instructor that Cyril, I think it's St. Cyril and Athanasius Orthodox Institute in San Francisco, St. Catherine College in Encinitas at California Baptist University. He is a member of the Orthodox Theological, Theological Society of America and participates in yearly academic forums and symposia. Father Josiah has served as a member of the Secretariat of the Assembly of Orthodox Bishops in the United States since its inception in May 2010. So, David, you know, it's interesting how well-versed this guy was. I mean, for a person in in his craft or ministry for about, I think, about 30, 30 years, um, he's definitely got a well-rounded view, it sounds like, um, in education and experience of the orthodoxy and the viewpoint of the history of this, of, you know, what he, of what his profession is. So I hope to be able to see that appreciation of his hard work that he does as a, as a life profession um, unlike someone who would be coming straight out of the seminary or, or educational field. Looking at this book, you know, for, for, for face value, you know, I think we can, I think we can both agree that it's very well laid out. Um, and, and I think the, the forward has a couple pieces, I know David, that you said that stood out to you. Yeah, and we'll, we'll go over those in a second. And just to give a little bit more overview, essentially the book is going to go over the history of Protestantism, especially um, probably up to uh, Reformation, Radical Reformation, and then more modern stuff is covered in, I think, one chapter. Uh, so it really covers everything, but it's really 
started more on the earlier times of Protestantism, and this is all from a, a Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox perspective. So I'm going to start, we're going to be working on the introduction in most of chapter one today, and I wanted to, I'm going to read a section from near the end of the introduction. Um, there's multiple editions of this book, so the pages might be a little different, but uh, so I'll start here. Politics played a definitive role in the enduring success of the Protestant Reformation. The imperial princes of the 15th and 16th century were upset by the taxation policy of the Roman Church, as well as its political encroachment into German sovereign estates. During this time, local diocesan bishops were competing for control with European political powers, and the early Protestant leaders found a receptive audience amongst rulers who were pleased to hear that Rome had no temporal rights over Germany. So, Elisha, do you have any initial thoughts about that? I think one of the key characters that we definitely hear about frequently whenever, if you, if you have any form of faith, is talking about Paul, um, and, and Paul and his, you know, his, his present-day um, effect when it comes to Rome. You know, that was part of his heritage and, and kind of his, his educational background. Um, if you know anything about Paul, um, he's kind of a wise guy and, and very much a highly edu educated individual. And, you know, it's kind of funny how there's conflict over tax, it sounds like that, in, in, in some of this discussion that you just read. Yeah, and it, I think it really out, outlines the <clears throat> probably multifaceted nature of the Reformation. It wasn't just people wanting a religious change. It was, you know, multiple facts to factors. So I think it, it's important to have a complex view. And this political aspect of it is very important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting how politics seems to be not only a uh, present day factor in, in when talking about history, such as this in Paul, um, but also just in, in everyday, in, in modern day, where it's, a determining factor to get people stirred up to want to talk about how they view the world and how they see it. So I think that was a good good point to bring up. Yeah, and just to reiterate, just a little farther down from where I read the previous quote, <clears throat> I'm just going to read another one that uh, drives that point home as well. Resistance to papal authority was in the air of Western Europe and was supported by the kings of France and Spain. A strong argument can be made that the Protestant Reformation itself was more land grabbed by the Protestant princes than about ecclesiastical renewal, and that without their cooperation, Martin Luther would have been a flame that quickly ignited, but then rapidly dissipated. So, Elisha, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I guess I think that, you know, the just well writtenness of this author's intent, you know, is already lively and very vivid. I think that's something that you can definitely appreciate as we look closer at this, at their work of, of authorship. I think that they have a point when it comes to Martin Luther, which kind of leads to my, my opening point. You know, when you read this book for face value a little bit for me, um, you know, at first I was like, man, this is, you know, a really good breakdown. And, and, I, and I won't spoil too much for you. Um, but, you know, opening into chapter one, I'm looking at just a little bit of the just the, the childhood nature of like, you know, where, where he's born. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of just a little bit of his history. Talking about Martin Luther, um, his mother, Margaret, was from a reputable family. Luther was one of the nine children, but only five survived to adulthood. He was educated at the Mang Mangberg and Arsbach, and then or Fart University, where he became a nominalist. Luther was a law student, but had a near-death experience during a lightning storm that altered his, his, his life course. Interesting to see how very fast, you know, that just like spanned maybe, I don't know, what, 15, 20 years of his life right there. Yeah, and I, that incident with the lightning storm, I think, was very important for 
Well, you know, as it says in the book, you know, changing the course of his life and I think putting him on more of a religious course, is that right? Yeah, I guess it gives a more expansive view on the fact that, like, this is where his, I don't know, initiation process of looking at, you know, where did religion become more like an ownership process in his life? Like, where he actually started taking it seriously. And this kind of altered his life course to maybe, I would say, a little more serious about, you know, what does, you know, his faith look like in his life. Yeah. And then a little later on, and there's this interesting section here, talks about he goes to Rome and he's starting to get um, disenchanted with... The, at least the Christianity he was seeing in Rome. So he says here, he also heard in Rome for the first time in his life outrageous, grotesque, and public blasphemy out of the mouths of clerics, sometimes even during the masses. He was scandalized by the mockery of the saints and joking about the Eucharist by the Roman liturgy, by the Roman clergy. So this doesn't completely go into detail but exactly what this was, but it's clear that he's becoming t he's he's starting his disenchantment process very charged by life and what's in front of him trying to see what is the truth and what has really been added into the truth looking a little bit closer at this book it talks about luther becoming ordained as a roman priest in 1507 in 1507 it talks a little bit about his father being present in his life a little bit and then there's an interesting point about how there are some who think that Luther um, took this encounter with not being able to finish the, the canon of the Mass. Interesting. Didn't know that about him. Um, and many of Lutheran's Roman Catholic adversaries would later reference this incident in their attempt to portray Luther as a psychological impaired person due to an unfortunate upbringing. Interesting how this small encounter, uh, you know, in this early or ordination, appears to be a maybe questionable moment in his life. I don't know. Interesting how you know he's he's among people who are very highly educated and have studied the scriptures and other other day and time, and also not only just the the scriptures but also maybe the more legalistic perspective at that time and the political viewpoint and they are looking at him as a you know as a colleague and saying man your your viewpoint your psychological state is impaired due to this upbringing this is when you know things went really really wrong and you need to correct this you know yeah i've heard i think i i took a class on the reformation i think i heard these about these accusations before about his upbringing i don't think they're really uh, i'm not sure if there's any basis to them uh that would be some research that would have to be done for you know there to be a conclusion on my part um the and I think also it's important to remember too there's a I'll read just a short section here during this period of his life this is you know uh, another section what this is the period um, during his studies um, Luther was tormented by the question of whether he was or was not among the elect or predestined and doesn't go into it so much as maybe other places but he was really into kind of um, laying down on cold floors like all this stuff to try to punish the body to become more holy is what I've heard uh, Elisha have you heard anything about that I know it wasn't really touched on in the book but I have heard there are some extreme points in Luther's life these are just not my opinions but just looking at history that Luther went to very grievous moments to uh, face affliction on his own body to be as selfless or trying to portray 
actions of selflessness towards God that he might reveal himself in a way that would be honoring or um, more sacrificial in a way. Um, and, and I don't know how true these are, but I've heard glimpses and moments of, you know, the seriousness of one's faith. And I think that may have been more of a definitive part of Luther's life where his colleagues were taking this as a nonchalant act of, you know, this is what we do. This is our cultural thing. This is just, a, you know, maybe a little bit more of a bandwagon sense. Um, but with Luther, he realized that what he was truly taking on as a priest in his day and time was something that um, could later affect him and at that time, I think what they talked about was was purgatory. Um, you know, he affected his past and present um, relatives. Um, and he took that at a greater seriousness than I think some of his colleagues. And I think, and I, I believe, I think it, I've heard something about him, like, laying down on cold floors and... Um, maybe doing other things like that. I think it's very important to see this as one of the important things kind of really forming. I think all, a lot of Lutheranism and his theology, it's this, this dislike for, I think the law, not, not to say he's entirely against the law, but just like he, I've heard that he wanted to remove the book of James from the Bible because it, you know, faith without works is dead. Um, and, you know, he didn't, he didn't like that aspect of it. So he, he was really tortured by <clears throat> trying to, the works aspect of the Bible. And really, I mean, when you look at Lutheranism, it's very focused on, on grace and, you know, the work works aspect is definitely um, not. It's not that it's not there, or it's not that you shouldn't do be good, but it's just grace is really the important aspect of Lutheranism. I think you really see that with with Martin Luther. Now, the question is why why was he so insecure about it? Uh, I don't know. I think that's a question that maybe if you really delve deep into Martin Luther you'd know but I think we I I don't have much insight into that um, well I think this book begins to chip away at it a little bit when we kind of warm up to talking about the 95 thesis it brings that up in chapter 1 and it talks about a little bit about how I'm going to read a little bit for you the 95 thesis are not an articulate art, art, articulation of the fundamentalization of the Protestant dogma and could be assented to as much by an orthodox or principle as by a Protestant. The posting of the of these for debate on the door for the castle um, church was not unusual in Wittenberg, but was a typical academic exercise as a call for debate. And this was the usual place to post such things. Other over time Luther's pose came to be viewed as a manifesto of reform. These, the, these were reproduced and distributed widely throughout Germany within weeks. It was not the 95 Theses themselves that had such a revolutionary effect on posterity, but rather the sub subsequent debate on the question of the fallibility of councils, the supreme power of the Pope, and the right to admonish the Church on scriptural grounds to change her ways. So opening to your thought was maybe the way he looked at the law and how it was being maybe possibly abused um, or maybe even skewed might start to be a, be an answer to that question. What do you think? And, and there's another section coming up too I want to address as well. So you, I think what you're saying is the amount of Law that he was witnessing was creating a kind of radical reaction in the other direction. Is that what you're saying? I think there was a heavy imbalance in, in the Roman Catholic Church at that time where there was a lot of skewed view. And Martin Luther is looking over here saying, Here's what scripture says 
for plain value, and here's what's being transpired in our culture at times. And so it kind of stirred him on to want to articulate something different. It talks a little bit more. It says Luther also articulated that, articulated what would become the three fundamental slogans of the Protestant Reformation. Sola fide, 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 I'm saying it wrong, I'm sorry guys. Faith alone, sola gratis, grace alone, and sola scriptura, which is scripture alone. Um, and, and then it goes on to talking a little about excommunications. He got three times, that happened three times, once by his Austinian order, once by the Pope, and once by the Imperial. And I guess, you know, it's interesting how your colleagues can say, you know, you're, you know, you're favorable and with us, but then we also don't like what you're saying when you're talking about the truth with us. Yeah, so I, I think it said he was excommunicated by his fellow colleagues, is that right, I think? Yeah, by the Augustinian, Augustinian order, uh, by, by the Pope, and by um, an imperial. You know, he's he's looking for some of the similar answers as his colleagues are. You know, the truth and, and how do I um, guide people in, in this office of priesthood? And, you know, when I'm talking about it or talking about, you know, what that means, um, people want you to take more of a legalistic point of view on that time frame. Yeah, and it seems like the church had gotten to a point of being very... Ju maybe judicial might be the term to the point of even you know selling indulgences you know selling forgiveness of sins so you know the the catholic church had really become very corrupt and you also get this you know this political aspect of you know they're collecting taxes they're having political um face-offs with the German princes. So you, it's understandable, you know, the, at least, you know, the problems that Martin Luther was seeing. And I think what you're seeing is a kind of a maybe radical reaction to the other end. You know, you want to get, a, get rid of everything Catholic and create something. You, you see... Catholicism is something negative, so you're going to make, in a lot of ways, something that's the opposite of it. And I'll read. So there was this famous guy who was selling indulgences, Father Tetzel. And I'm going to read uh, a little of his preaching. It says, here is an example of Tetzel's preaching. Do you hear the voices of your dead parents and other, other people screaming and saying, Have pity on me, have pity on me, for the, the hand of God toucheth me. We are suffering severe punishments and pain from which, from which you could rescue us with a few alms if only you would. Open your ears because the father is calling to the son and the mother to the daughter. And so the indulgent preacher's message was summarized by the reformers in these words, your coin into the treasury jings and a soul from purgatory springs. Do you have any thoughts on that, Elisha? It sets a lot of tension in, in the history at that point. When you're looking at, you know, Martin Luther and dealing with these these moments. Yeah, and it, you know, it's very, you know, forgiveness of sins. You know, it, it's obviously, I think, pretty much everybody can agree how corrupt the sale of indulgences is i think the catholic church has come out and said condemned the practice um it, was, it left a, a void of you know people's innocence being um uh, for lack of better words um incomplete you know where people are trying to really be redeemed and and uh whole again for their sins and um the remedy of absolving that and that path of, of trying to be sold for selling or paying for it is, you know, turned out to be insufficient in many, many ways. And um, they've had to abandon that practice. Yeah, I think another important thing is some people 
have characterized Western Christianity as being more judicial, like a courtroom, whereas Eastern Christianity is more like a hospital for for souls. And I think you definitely see it in the indulgences piece where people are paying for forgive, forgiveness of sins. I think that, you know, when you bring that up, it makes me think of how oftentimes one of the driving factors to sustainability of life in our normal day-to-day life is to adequately be compensated so that we can pay for the things of you know, importance in our life, you know, it covers the necessities and a little bit of our wants. And uh, it's interesting in our, when it comes to our spiritual needs, oftentimes many people think that that adequately transfers over. You know, you can pay for, you know, better care or spiritual care or, or uh, means of, you know, high quality faith in a way. And, you know, we, we find that to be um, not necessarily... <laughs> The proper approach because you can still end up paying for whatever you know you can try and pay for the greatest preacher or the greatest document or you know the greatest kind of piece and you realize that there's still that void that you still need to address um, and I think Martin Luther really began to open that conversation up even though um, in his time of of trying to seek God first in his life and um, deal with the with what the church had become post Christ um, you know he got ridiculed I mean even in this book it talks about how in the same section a little bit that it was assumed by his interrogators initially that Luther was not smart enough to have pro- produced the work ascribed to him talking about the 95 Theses and that perhaps he was a front man, front man figure for a more accomplished mind like Arabus or some of the nearly, or someone of nearly that stature, Luther was tried in Apostine and Rome for heresy, and summoned to appear before the Pope. His political um, benefactor, Elector Frederick III of, of Saxony, succeeded in getting the venue changed from Rome to Augsburg. Um, and and it's interesting because they tried to get him to recant. And he fled and took refuge under the protection of Elector Frederick. And then later on, um, he still didn't do it. And that is where he denied the prime primacy of the Pope and the infallibility of the General Council. And it's interesting to what measure did Luther go to, you know, try and right the wrongs of what he was saying in front of him. You know, I think at night he didn't sleep very peacefully because he realized what kind of mess the scripture had been taken to to a whole nother level. Yeah, and we'll get more into, I think once we get to the next chapter, more into Martin Luther as a person. And I think that's that will be very interesting as well, describing, you know, how that plays into Lutheranism and Protestantism. So fast forwarding a little bit from our point of excommunication, um, I'm looking at Luther and he's excommunicated from the church a little bit. And at this point, you know, passing by the fact that he's calling the Pope the Antichrist and he's writing down a lot of his teachings and you stumble across this this uh, part when it's talking about the small catechism Um, and it kind of just breaks down this like confession of of Martin Luther Um, it's it's providing a basic instruction on the Ten Commandments the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles Creed as well as the sacraments of baptism confessions and Eucharist and it's interesting because it's so well esteemed uh, by the um, church at that time and that the uh, that it becomes almost a cornerstone of the evangelical doctrine um, which is the was the only official Lutheran document written solely by Luther himself um, and it's just interesting to catch that as a, as a big big part of it and it also looks like that 
the uh, Protestants and the Roman Catholics uh, um, took took uh, took a well taking to it. I don't know if you know much about the small catechism, David, but it's interesting that you know Luther was kind of more hands on with this this uh, document during his time frame. Yeah, what didn't it say? It was the only. What did it say exactly? It was the it only. It was the only official Lutheran document written by him solely. So, if that is the case, then that means everything in the, the Lutheran Church nowadays was um, more is more a reflection of what he wrote during his time frame. Yeah. As some a resource that may be a good thing to look into. Um, into relating to the corruption of the Catholic Church. There's a book, I haven't read it, but it may be of interest to you. It's called The Occult Renaissance Church of Rome by Michael Hoffman. And I believe uh, Jay Dyer has talked about that book, um, at least mentioned it. And I wanted to read a passage here. It's, and let's see if I can get, a, get it so it makes sense. I'll start a little bit into the sentence. Infallible authority would become the scriptures, this is talking about Protestantism, privately interpreted, and this standard has proven over the last 500 years to be no standard at all. So this is starting to get into the what I think is maybe the most core tenet of Protestantism, which is the sola scriptura, um, scripture alone, uh, the text being the most important and what this leads to is there's no there's no context for the text so what 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 happens is this this is all my you know my belief and we'll we'll get into other thing you know elisha's viewpoint everything uh, what happens is the text itself does not necessarily present the truth to a person there's going to be all these different viewpoints from people interpreting it and you're going to get essentially all these different perspectives so that the pra that reality and the and the practice is a refutation of sola scriptura and the fact that you know the text itself presents this clear obvious truth and um you know, you could also look at things like Revelation, you know, saying that, you know, Revelation is clear and um, easily understood. I think anybody who's looked at Revelation can see that's not the case. And you also look at Protestant Protestantism in practice. The text has not proved a unifying factor. It's proved a divisive factor. I mean, the thousands of Protestant de denominations, all the different viewpoints. And it seems that... Uh, you know, now with more modern Protestantism, the it has become even more detached from uh, tradition, really, of, a, of any kind. Um, and I, I think, you know, some people could even say that, you know, Martin Luther was the first postmodernist because it really, although not explicit, the postmodernist point is that uh, at least partially, the text, there's no base, the text has no basis in reality, if I'm saying it correctly. So, it's, the text in of, of itself does not have a clear, explicit meaning. Um, it needs context. So it, you get into this interesting point of maybe traditionalists and postmodernists agreeing on things and also, um, you know, both having common cause against modernism, which was starting to take root with Protestantism. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Elisha to see if he has any comments. I think it's a good lead-in point to some of our later discussions we're going to have. But basically, I think one of the things that, anyone who is either not of faith or is just kind of warming into faith, you know, like figuring out where they stand and what are they going to do with, you know, their faith. This is something to look at because you're going to get two sides of one coin where um, 
the worldview of these audiences of you know people who are more Protestant and people who are more um, maybe a little more in the ancient history and orthodox orthodox orthodoxal viewpoint. Um, it it differs. Um, it seems very very similar. It's like the same coin, but they they look differently and feel differently, and they're on different sides of the the puzzle. Um, I would say that um, you know for for this discussion um, that we are having and walking through this book book, um, it is fun to see that there's a lot of things in history that go on that play into you know how people were formed and kind of sh sharpened and nudged in history due to the, the severity of how people took their faith very seriously um, you know especially in a time where the social structure is um, more um, engaged and maybe a little bit more uh, a little bit more unapologetic in their tone of speech and and how they associate with people um, I don't know if revered is a good word to, to bring up, but it seems like people are like, yeah, I believe this, and I'm willing to, to fight for it to the death. So, yeah, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, and in around the next part, it starts to talk about John Wycliffe, John Huss as kind of forerunners to Martin Luther. We won't get into that deeply unless um, we feel the need to, but those were men who really were, I guess, you might say Protestants in a way before Protestantism really happened. And Yeah, I feel like they're starting starting members of, of that cause of trying to be the change and be, be a light into something that was very hard and challenging to face in that day and time. I think I, if I could only get a taste of what it was like back in the the day, the ancient days, you know, living in Germany and experiencing the culture, um, and the challenges they faced, they 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 faced in health and education and transportation and and really just the holistic perspective of trying to figure out life. I often wonder how do you um, embrace you know, a time period where you saw things drastically change um, in an era where, you know, the rules of the earth, they directly affected your life on a more um, abrasive level. You know, you, you know, you could literally break a lot of laws and death could be the penalty very quickly. Versus today, in a way, being looking modern, you know, yeah, we have a legal system, and at least in my more Western culture, you know, there's levels of severity and penalty of more of a fine or or causation of just you know maybe jail time, but not to the same severity in, in any sense of of that time period. So those are a few of my my, my thoughts as I as I think about history. So we're going to start wrapping up here, and we're coming to a close. This is a really good quote. It's a little longer, but it's very much worth it. This is near the end of chapter one. The Protestant Reformation was born in controversy, gave birth to controversy, and has continued to spawn irre irreconcilable controversies for the last 500 years. Luther's last years were deeply scarred by unresolved controversies. The greatest of these took place at the Colloquy of Marburg in 1529. This official gathering was designed to unify the Protestant theologians, but instead served to express the deepest of divisions between Luther and Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli on the subject of the Eucharist. Zwingli denied that the Eucharist was the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. Luther thought that his own teaching, known to the history of theology as consubstantiation was the clear teaching of scripture and neither could understand why the other was being so hard-headed and disobedient to the clear teaching of scripture the marburg colloquy and protestant eucharistic controversy revealed the greatest weakness of the protestant embrace of the doctrine of sola scriptura 
and prove the absurdity of any dependence on the clarity of Scripture alone to establish common doctrines. Luther felt very deeply on this matter and said, Before I would have mere wine with the fanatics, I would rather receive sheer blood with the Pope. Accomplished Protestant leaders like Karlstadt, Zwingli, Ocolampadius in Basel and Busser in Strasbourg disavow Luther's teaching on the sacraments and church polity. We Orthodox Christians are led to ponder, where is the reality of sola scriptura and the perspicuity of scripture, if even those bound by faculty, friendship, politics, and faith cannot agree on the meaning of the central Christian act of worship? Did you have any thoughts on that? It's interesting that it talks about how controversy was the biggest factor in that even to the death of Martin Luther those controversies were still um, being worked out or resolved um, you know we talked a little bit earlier about how he was a law student uh, just initially kicking off uh, his adult life and how in a way um, the very nature of the people who he was dealing with um, kind of set him up with the thinking about law how he ends up basically taking a stance of trying to cut out the law in a lot of ways of of the church and in, in his present day time because it appeared to be um, in many ways a stifling block to you know the scripture alone segment um, I often find it interesting that sometimes that we we look at people in, in history that some would say are very revered in their faith or revered in their viewpoint, but also were equally mocked greatly in their time. Um, and that's just interesting because there's many who would look at the Reformation and say it was, uh, it was, it was good for someone to speak up and actually not be a, be a part of a bandwagon, but it's also interesting that there are some on the other side of the aisle who would say, man, they look so foolish. So it's, it's just interesting to see how controversies still play out in today as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just, just to finish off the chapter, we'll, we might touch on the chapter more depending if we feel that there's other things that we need to hit, but I'll just read the little sections here that kind of finishes it off. Melanchthon heard of the death of his colleague and mentor while in the middle of class and cried out, the, char- the charioteer of Israel has fallen, talking about Luther. And then a little bit farther down it says, On May 19, 1547, only 15 months after Luther's death, Wittenberg capitulated to the Holy Roman Emperor, who was attempting to impose his Catholicism by force. The political conflict in Germany only ended after the Thirty Years' War, which left Germany scourged in 1648, when Catholics, Lutherans, and Calvinists arraigned to, to coexist. Though the future looked bleak for Protestantism at the time of Luther's death, history is full of surprises. So I think that will end our comments, unless, um, Elisha, you have anything. We'll, we'll have a couple comments of after as well. My only, real, my only real initial point that I just wanted to leave off is that, you know, it talks a little bit about how at that time there's a war, uh, and it looks like it's more internal than it is external. And it's really trying to find a, a happy medium as a cultural, as it shifts in direction on how does authority look, how does politics look, how does religion look, how does our everyday life look. And I often find it, and if I'm correct in history, Germany faces some of some grave instances where it has to culturally shift its view and, and stance due to the... Due to, um, moments of war tension within itself okay and then if i think this is just um a little bit of perspective on our elisha and i's perspective on things elisha did you want to make any comments on what where you're coming from so i wanted to talk about this a little bit more as we close so um david and i we've you know we're we're a little bit similar but different um, we um, definitely grew up in you know a Western culture, and we've experienced many variant variations of people who are 
a different viewpoint. And so I would definitely say that I am more on the Protestant side of things. Um, you know, I've grown up in the church a little bit, and I've learned um, quite a bit on that on that spectrum. You know, I've never really questioned the validity of my um, Protestant viewpoint in the sense of whether, um, you know, I'm losing value um, in, in maybe the relevancy of, you know, everyday life. Um, you know, I often would say that the scripture can definitely move people in, um, give them clarity where it's needed. Um, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so I think that's one thing that I keep as a defining measure when it comes to my faith. Um, and I'm going to let David talk a little bit about the path that he's on and his viewpoint. Yeah, so I, as a kid, from when I start to be able to remember um, having come back from Japan, was went to a Catholic church as a as a small kid and then went to a Lutheran church for most of my youth um, where my parents were going and then after that uh, went to an Anglican church and in terms of I was baptized and confirmed as a Lutheran in the ELCA is that right? Uh, no. LCMS LCMS yes and then was going to a, I can't remember if it was Anglican or Reformed Episcopal. I didn't formally join. And then was going, Then I went, after that, I went to a Catholic church. I wasn't taking communion or I didn't become Catholic, but I was attending. And then um, was involved in the Hebrew Roots Movement for a little bit. And then uh, got more interested in orthodoxy and then... I am a catechumen in the process of converting right now. So that would be my background. And I think one one final thing, unless Elisha has something to say, I was really impressed by his third edition uh, book. It's a very, uh, very nice size, kind of large. It's got some really nice art on the cover, and it's got some nice, nice pictures inside, really looks... Just a nice layout inside of his third edition of Rock and Sand. It's uh, really a nice book. I was impressed seeing it. Um, I know the older edition. I, have, I think I might have the first edition uh, loaned to me. Uh, it's it's all right, but you know not as not as nice. Um, so I think that's gonna end our uh, podcast here today. Um, Elisha can make any you have any comments or uh, I just want anything to say, you want to plug thank you guys for tuning in you know I hopefully you're able to enjoy our discussions you know let us know if you, there's any questions or comments uh, that you want to know more about this book I will tell you that diving into this book um, for face value you know covers can be a little deceiving so don't think that you're walking into something that's just going to be an easy read um, it's definitely insightful and has a lot of content it's a little more meatier than expected yeah, and it, it's it's also yeah. There's a, there's a lot of stuff in there, but it's fairly fairly easily read. Um, yeah, it, it kind of it strikes a good balance between readability and academics, I think. So, and uh, thank you for listening. We'll be back in the future with another podcast covering chapter two and some other stuff possibly um we'll be working our way through the book so please like share and subscribe and thank you for listening